Acts chapter 4, 5 through 12. The next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. <coughs> our speaker today is our brother Chuck Rungi, and the title of his talk today is In Jesus' Name. Brother Chuck. Good morning. What does it mean to preach on the name of Jesus? Well, it means to tell people about Jesus. Jesus is central to the hope of the gospel, and it's impossible to preach the gospel without talking about Jesus. Why do we have the hope that we have? It's because of Jesus. Why do we preach? So that others might share our hope in Jesus. Like we read in Acts 4 just a moment ago, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is his personal name, which is the Greek version of Joshua, actually Yahshua, meaning Yahweh saves, or God is salvation. So my understanding is that Jesus is called the salvation of God. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus, the Christ of God, was given a special name. The angel told Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. So Jesus was not a name chosen by his parents. And it was not the name of one of his ancestors. It was a name appointed for him by an angel before he was born. We call upon the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus Christ, but Lord and Christ are not names, those are titles. By Lord, we refer to a superior, someone that we might call Sir or Your Honor. In a feudal context, it means an absolute superior, like an owner or a master. Christ is his title, and it means the anointed one, which is how he was designated and appointed by the Father. Kings and prophets were identified by pouring oil over their heads, but Jesus was anointed by the Spirit of God. Christ means anointed, like the prophets of old anointed kings, but Jesus was anointed to his kingship by God. This means that Jesus is not just another teacher or not just another prophet. Jesus was chosen by God 
for a special position absolutely unique in human history. Jesus is always named when people are baptized. <laughs> Baptism is intended to signify agreement with the teachings of Jesus and agreement to follow the pattern of life that he showed us. As we can read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance for offenses against God and man, followed by forgiveness, was central to his teaching, symbolized by joining Jesus in his death and rising with him in his resurrection. This teaching of forgiveness from God by acknowledging Jesus was consistent with what God has been teaching for a long time. Acts 10 verse 43 tells us, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes him believes in him, receives forgiveness of sins. This forgiveness is what we need to be reconciled to God, and this leads to the urgency of the message because it can be the difference between life and death to those who are perishing. Acts 22, verse 16 says, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Compared to us, the apostles were quite aggressive in urging people to action, and they were being heard by people with understanding who immediately did what they said. Acts 8 verse 12 tells us, But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized men and women alike. Jesus imparted the Holy Spirit to those who were close to him. They were able to forgive sins and heal the sick when Jesus sent them out into the world. First, it was just the twelve, and later there were seventy-two who were sent. But after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the day Pentecost had come, his disciples were still able to perform miracles of healing as God directed them. As in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, where Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. The faith of those who heard also played an important role in these healings. This is consistent with Jesus' comments made to those who were healed, such as, Your faith has made you well. In Acts 3, verse 16, we see, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. In 3 John chapter 2, verse 12, John writes, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. The Apostle John understood how important it was to know our sins were forgiven and that it was accomplished for the sake of his name. It is in remembrance of Jesus that we are forgiven. If there is no forgiveness, we would still be shackled by sin without a hope in the world. The fact that there is forgiveness of sins motivate us, motivates us to obtain the promised reward. But how is forgiveness for the sake of his name? These little children addressed by John, had previously been sinners, but were now without sin. They shared in the blessing of forgiveness, which arises from the grace and mercy of God and proceeds based on the blood and sacrifice of Christ, and therefore it is said to be for his name's sake. 
This was not anything earned by men, but something that was given for the sake of Christ, for his blood and his sacrifice. This forgiveness reaches out to forgive sins both public and private. The Spirit intends us to receive it by faith, by the love of God who freely and fully forgives us, and the love of Christ whose blood was shed for the remission of sin. Their brethren share equally in the blessing because they are loved by God, and they too learn to forgive because God has forgiven them for Christ's sake. We love because he first loved us. Revelation 14, verse 1 says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 140,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Having his name on their foreheads is a symbol of putting his thoughts at the front of our mind. This corresponds to the phylacteries in the law, which contained scriptural writings that were bound on the head and the hand. What distinguishes the saints will be how the thinking of Jesus is impressed upon their minds. This is preparation for service and will be seen in their deeds but they will already have a solid understanding. The saints won't be arriving in need of introductory training. The need to understand the scriptures is required if we are to know what Jesus said, if we are to know what Jesus did, and what all the scriptures announce about Jesus. If we love God with all of our minds, we will fill our minds with scripture and be comforted by the confidence that comes from knowing the will of God. When we look for doctrine in the New Testament, we don't always find it written down, but we can observe the actions of those that heard and draw our own conclusions about what they believed. Acts 9, verse 27 says, But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. When Paul saw the risen Christ with his own eyes, he was given some time to think about it because the fundamental principles that governed his life needed to be replaced. But when he resumed his life, he began speaking out in Jesus' name. And not just speaking up, he was speaking out boldly. We are reluctant sometimes to talk about Jesus in front of people who would revile him and revile us for speaking about him. But first century preachers faced more than a negative opinion. In Acts 4, 18, we see, And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But skipping ahead to the next chapter in Acts 5, verse 40, after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. But this did not deter them. When they spoke out boldly, it was in the full knowledge that they would be opposed by the authorities and even punished for their preaching. In fact, they took this as an encouragement that they were on the same path that Jesus walked. So Acts 5 continues, they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus put them in conflict with the governing authorities. They were flogged, and they were ordered to stop doing this. But they chose to obey God rather than men, and they risked their lives 
for the name of our Lord Jesus. This is remembered by God and honored by him. The fact that their names are recorded recognizes their good deeds and serves as a memorial until the day of their resurrection. Hebrews 6 verse 10 reads, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Because of their speaking out in Jesus' name, many brethren will be brought to repentance and salvation. God knows the difference, and he will not forget. Romans 1 verse 5 says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Preaching resurrection, repentance, forgiveness, and baptism in the name of Jesus is a continuation of the work of God. For those who doubt that this is the work of God, we can simply consider the examples that the New Testament sets before us. When we pick up the great work of announcing the salvation of God in the earth, we join together with Jesus, the apostles, and the entire company of saints. We work together with them. We hope together with them, and God willing, we will inherit together with them. So, in conclusion, how do we preach on the name of Jesus? Well, first, we have to say his name. Jesus has a special name, and he is central to the message. How can we do something in his name if we won't even say his name? How will anyone learn about Jesus if we don't even mention him? How can we receive what we ask for if we don't pray in Jesus' name? Jesus is the most important thing in the message, and if he's not, then it's the wrong message. We teach what he taught. The Gospels in particular are filled with what Jesus taught, and Jesus taught from the lessons God gave us in the Old Testament. We have plenty of material, and we don't need to add to it, and we don't need to take away from it. And what was it that Jesus was saying? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And to paraphrase, get ready, because Jesus is coming back to establish God's kingdom in the earth. We can do what he did to the limits of our abilities. Jesus built up those who were wavering. Jesus rebuked those who opposed God. And Jesus called to those who were lost. Jesus knew the difference between good and evil as shown by the Father, and he showed mercy to those who were sick, illustrating the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus gave hope to the hopeless. Finally, we can praise him, glorify him, and keep telling people what he has done. God himself has glorified Jesus, and we too praise and glorify him when we talk about his great victory over sin and death about his ascension into heaven, about the promise of his return. Jesus is the champion, the hero, the greatest person ever born, and Jesus is our reason to rejoice. Preaching in Jesus' name brings the grace of God to others and the mighty deeds of faith by men of old to remembrance and all of this brings glory to God the Father.